This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Hi there, welcome to Up and Atom, I'm Jade. There's a type of object that has finite volume, but infinite surface area. This seems to lead to paradoxes like being able to fill it with paint, but never finish painting it. Today we're going to look at the math behind one of these objects and talk about what it means. The first of these objects was discovered in the 17th century by a student of Galileo, Evangelista Turricelli. It was given the name Gabriel's Horn after the archangel Gabriel who blew his horn to announce Judgment Day, perhaps hinting at what it was about to do to mathematics. Torricelli had discovered an object that was infinite in surface area, yet finite in volume, that was infinitely long, but not infinitely big. This launched him to mathematical fame because it intuitively doesn't make sense. It also connected the finite, which we can experience, to the infinite, which we can't. This blurred the line between the mathematical and physical worlds. How is it possible and what does it mean for mathematics? The math behind Gabriel's horn is pretty complicated. So in this video, we're going to look at a mathematically simpler object with the same weird property. Well, it's actually a series of objects. Here are a series of cubes that get smaller and smaller. The biggest measures one foot by one foot by one foot. The second biggest measures one over square root two feet by one over square root two feet by one over square root two feet. The third biggest measures one over square root three feet by one over square root three feet by one over square root three feet. This pattern continues with the nth biggest cube measuring 1 over square root n feet by 1 over square root n feet by 1 over square root n feet. Now imagine that you have an infinite number of cubes. This is the series of objects we'll be working with. Cubes have six square faces, so the surface area is just six times the area of each face. The area is just one side multiplied by the other to give us the equation 6s squared. To calculate the total surface area of all the cubes, we just add all of their surface areas together. This gives us an infinite series, the sum of an infinite number of terms. We can get a better sense of what this series is doing if we represent it graphically. Naturally, the surface area of each cube gets smaller as they get smaller. As we add them together, the total surface area approaches infinity. It does this pretty slowly, as at 100,000 cubes we're only at 72.5 feet squared, but when we plot it on a log linear graph, where the x-axis goes up in a log scale, we can clearly see the trend is up. This isn't too surprising. It's kind of what we'd expect from infinitely many cubes. Now let's calculate their volume. The volume of a cube is just the height times width times depth, which gives us s cubed. Again, to calculate the total volume, we just add all the individual volumes together. Let's see what happens when we sum them up. It's increasing at a much slower rate this time. At 100,000 cubes, the volume is still only 2.6 cubic feet. Even when we plot it on a log linear graph, the curve flattens out. Rather than going off to infinity, the volume of an infinite number of cubes approaches a finite number. The fact that an infinite sum adds to a finite number might sound weird, but it's not a new idea. It was revolutionary back in its day, but now our entire theory of calculus is based on it and math students don't think twice about it. The name of these kinds of series are called convergent series, as they converge to a number, as opposed to divergent series. But that's not what's weird about these cubes. What's weird is that they have an infinite surface area, but a finite volume. This just sounds wrong. It seems to imply that they can be filled with paint, but never be painted. That doesn't jibe with our intuition at all. Everyday experiences show that filling a volume usually takes a lot more paint than painting it. So it sounds weird to have their surface area be so much bigger than their volume. Secondly, instead of looking at the outer surface area of the cubes, let's look at the inner surface area. Doesn't filling the cubes automatically coat their inner surface area? Covering all the inside faces should take up the same amount of paint as covering the outside faces. 
So how can I fill a cube without also coating its surface area? Put another way, if the cubes were see-through, wouldn't they look painted from the outside? This is called the painter's paradox, and I actually like it best in its original form, in Gabriel's horn. The inner surface of the horn is infinite, therefore an infinite amount of paint is needed to paint the inner surface. But the volume of the horn is finite, so the inner surface can be painted by pouring a finite amount of paint into the horn, and then emptying it. So can we paint the inner surface or not? This stumped mathematicians of the 17th century too, making them doubt their entire theory of mathematics. But we'll see that there's nothing wrong with the math at all. The paradox lies entirely in our interpretation. Let's address the first point first. Why does the math tell us that their surface area is bigger than their volume? To understand, let me ask you a seemingly unrelated question. What is the length of this line? Try to describe it without referring to another length. Notice that saying something like it's so and so centimeters long is just describing it in terms of the length of a centimeter. Pause the video now if you'd like to try and let me know your answer in the comments. If you did manage to answer, you've just undermined the entire field of dimensional analysis, the study of the relationship between different physical quantities. Its key principle is that measurement is comparison between like objects. This means that 1. Absolute measurement doesn't exist, only relative measurement does, and 2. For a measurement to be meaningful, it needs to be compared to something of a similar dimension. For example, saying that one kilometer is longer than two yards is fine because they're both measuring a length. But saying that one hour is longer than two yards doesn't mean anything because they're not measuring the same thing. Sounds obvious, but now let me ask you, which is bigger, the surface area of this cube or the volume of this cube? Hopefully you've realized that this question doesn't make any sense. Surface area measures a two-dimensional surface and volume measures three-dimensional space. What does it mean to say a chunk of space is bigger than a chunk of area? It means about the same as saying a piece of time is longer than a piece of length. Nothing at all. We get tripped up because of everyday situations like needing more paint to fill a cube than coat it. And this makes us think that volume is somehow bigger than area. But these numbers aren't saying we need a bigger amount of paint to coat the surface area than to fill the volume. The surface area of all the cubes measured in feet squared is larger than any finite number of square feet. It's a comparison to other surface areas. The number 2.6 feet cubed is a comparison to other volumes. They aren't a comparison with each other. Mathematically, there is no paradox with a shape having infinite surface area and finite volume. There are other shapes that are infinite in one dimension and finite in another, like the Koch snowflake, which may be easier to visualize. It's a fractal which follows a simple iterative process. You end up with an infinitely long perimeter, but a finite area. These objects exist in the mathematical world, and when I say exist, I mean that they're consistent with the laws of that world. So that was the technical resolution to the paradox, that there is in fact no paradox. By trying to apply paint to an abstract volume and surface area, we were inadvertently comparing two incomparable quantities. Basically, don't try and paint infinite mathematical objects. But what if we did? I feel like this video wouldn't be complete unless we at least talked about what might happen. This is one interpretation. Now I say interpretation because we're applying unspecified paint to a mathematical infinite object. Depending on what assumptions you make, the outcome is going to change. This next section is not mathematically rigorous. It's more speculation based on mathematical and physical ideas. Feel free to share your own interpretations in the comments. That's part of the fun of these kinds of questions, after all. So looking at our questions from before, doesn't filling something with paint automatically cover its surface area? Covering all the inside faces of the cubes should take up the same amount of paint as covering the outside faces, right? If the cubes were see-through, wouldn't they look painted from the outside? When we asked these questions, we were assuming that you can have a pure surface area of paint, 
But this is of course not true. When you finish painting your walls, the can is empty. Physical paint has volume and thickness. When the cubes are big, this thickness is negligible, which is why we kind of forget about it. But when the cubes become smaller, it becomes significant. At a point, it will take more paint to coat them than to fill them. So to answer our questions, filling the volume doesn't automatically cover their surface area, as the surface area uses separate and sometimes more paint than the volume. And the cubes wouldn't look painted from the outside, as they're missing their entire layer of thickness. Abstract mathematicians watching might be thinking, paint doesn't have to have thickness. What is this, physics? And sure, that's another interpretation. We can use paint that gets infinitely thin, but I'll leave that one up to you guys to speculate on below. Some people might say that it's a waste of time to even think about these kinds of questions, but it's questions like these that opened the eyes of mathematicians of the 17th century and led to a lot of the modern mathematics we enjoy today. Apart from the fact that it's fun, it exposes our flaws in thinking and makes us realize that even simple ideas like area and volume are more complicated than we might think. To end, I'd like to leave you with a quote that I think perfectly captures the spirit of this paradox. One then discovers a striking truth about mathematics, that it is not trapped in what is called reality, a tangible, intuitive life. Based on logic, mathematics can go farther than our imagination can sometimes go and leave us in awe when it systematically opunes the knowledge that we have so long considered as the truth. To have a purely mathematical object that can't exist in the real world raises some interesting questions. Does math exist only in our minds? Is it something we've invented to make sense of the world around us? Or does it exist outside of us and we discover it? The question of whether math is invented or discovered fascinated me so much that I made a feature video about it on Nebula. Nebula is a streaming platform made by a bunch of us educational YouTube creators where we can explore making different and experimental content. It's been nominated for a Streamy Award. Curiosity Stream, a streaming service with award-winning documentaries, is so supportive of our new venture, they're offering Nebula completely free when you sign up with them. There's a promotion going on right now where you get a 26% discount off the bundle. So that's two streaming services for just $14.80. In fact, there's a really cool documentary by Hannah Fry about the same question of whether math is an invention or discovery. It's full of trippy visuals and loads of mathematical ideas, but presented in a very easy to understand way. I watched the entire three hour series in one go. If you'd like to watch both mine and Hannah's take on this question, sign up with the link in the description or go to curiositystream.com slash upandatom and start discovering today. That's it from me and I'll see you in the next episode.